Welcome back to Cunningham's Law Review, where our goal is to listen to the top artists and songs of the last 100 years, starting in 1920 and working our way forward. Four days a week, we review what we hear and share the history of popular music with you, as we do. I'm Richie, and you're listening to Side A of episode 1922-1, where today we'll be talking about medicine shows, snake oil salesmen, and the OG Texas fiddle master and first country musician recorded, Eck Robertson. It's really interesting to think that despite the United States being much more urban now than in 1922, almost everything we've heard so far speaks from big city musical acts like jazz bands and vaudeville shows. In reality, there was a whole world outside of the city that blossomed out of the needs of con artists to sell cocaine, opium, and alcohol to country folk. Of course, even then, you couldn't go door-to-door as a drug salesman, you'd have to be smart about it. And so there were plenty of enterprising young con men who realized that if you call it medicine, it can't be bad, and so snake oil tonics were born. These were magic cure-alls that, good for man and beast, could cure frostbite, sore throat, backaches, arthritis, and even lumbago. The original snake oil salesman himself, Clark Stanley, was careful to note that these oils were external use only, but in the same flyer noted that oil cured toothaches and sore throats as well. How it could be for external use only and still cure a sore throat is a mystery to me, but I bet a lot of people tried it and realized that it made you feel really good when you drank it. But we're talking about a time before billboards, before TV, before radio ads even, and so in order to get a crowd to sell their cures to, snake oil salesmen would travel with groups of performers of all types in sometimes elaborate productions that would come to be called medicine shows. Now, medicine shows would travel from town to town, set up shop to perform, and then sell the cure-alls to the crowd they'd drawn at the intermission or on the side. The cure-alls often didn't do anything except dose you with B vitamins and cocaine, or alcohol and opium, but you'd certainly feel amazing after you drank them, and you'd think they did something. And that's not to mention that most of those substances are extremely addictive, and so you'd probably come back and buy some more. But we're not here to talk only about medicine shows, we're also here to talk about Eck Robertson, who, born in 1887 in Delaney, Arkansas, would move to the Texas Panhandle when he was only three years old, and for the rest of his life would be associated with the Lone Star State. Now, he came from a family of fiddlers, and with many of his immediate family members entering fiddlers' competitions, the instrument was impressed upon him young. When he was 16 years old, Robertson left home to become a professional musician, starting out his career with traveling medicine shows, but he would settle down with his wife by 19. Tuning pianos for income and playing fiddle and performing in local vaudeville to fuel his musical ambitions, Robertson also often played in and won fiddling competitions. In 1922, Robertson would meet and perform with Henry Galeland at the opening ceremony for the old Confederate soldiers' reunion in Richmond, Virginia. Robertson himself was not a veteran of the Confederacy, but his father was, and so was Galeland. Robertson and Galeland left for New York together to demand a recording contract with Victor. It's reported that when he went to Victor, Robert stepped into their offices and said, I'm Eck Robertson, and I'm the best fiddler in the world, and y'all ought to record me. So they did, because it was 1922, and that kind of stuff still worked. Having convinced Victor in 1922, Eck Robertson and Henry Galeland would become the first artists to record a country record, laying down songs Arkansas Traveler and Turkey in the Straw. Robertson was asked back the next day to record some more on his own, and that day he laid down Sally Gooden and five others. But unfortunately, some of those tracks were not issued and since have been lost. If you're trying to only listen to the 1922 tracks today, those are the first six songs on the playlist, and they end in Done Gone. Robertson wouldn't record again until 1929, and that's where the remainder of the tracks come from. Since those aren't contemporary, we won't be reviewing the 1929 tracks, but they're available if you want to hear more for posterity's sake. Robertson never saw much commercial success, and wouldn't even be appreciated much in his own time, even though artists like Vernon Dallert, who we'll talk about in an upcoming episode, would take up the country mantle for themselves based upon his work to great success. So let's stop talking about the music and start listening. For those of you listening to this podcast through Spotify, there's a version of the episode available to you which includes all of the music as part of the podcast, so you only have to press play once and everything including the music will play on its own. The episodes with built-in music are limited to Spotify, so if you're listening to this episode through a different service or on YouTube and still want to listen to the music, a playlist of what we're listening to today is available on Spotify under the title Cunningham's Law Review 1922-1. 
you don't need a paid account to access that playlist. You can also find a link to this episode on the Cunningham's Law Review subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash Cunningham's Law Review. We want to know what you think about our reviews and the music we're hearing, so make sure to join us on the subreddit, leave us an anchor voicemail, or reach out on Twitter at Cunning Review. That's all for side A of episode 1922-1. We'll see you for the reviews after the songs on side B. Welcome back to Cunningham's Law Review, episode 1922-1. Our first episode of the year 1922, where we're listening to the first country music tracks ever recorded today. You're now listening to the B-side of the podcast, where we review each of the songs in today's music and talk more about the impact that these songs had. And there was a lot of impact from these. If you'd like to join the conversation, the Cunningham's Law subreddit will have a dedicated post for this episode at reddit.com slash r slash Cunningham's Law Review. And we'd love to hear from you through an anchor voicemail or on Twitter at Cunning Review. I'm Richie, your host, and I hope you enjoyed the music or at least heard something new. But considering that Eck Robertson is relatively unknown, you probably did hear something new. Eck Robertson's music never did commercially well overall, despite his undeniable contribution to country music made by introducing Texas fiddling to audiences outside of the South. At the same time, it can definitely be said that the roots of country music at this point are deeply tied to the racist South and even the Confederacy. Since both of the recording artists on the first country track ever, Eck Robertson and Henry Galeland, met at a reunion of Confederate Army soldiers. While Robertson himself did not serve in the Confederacy, his father did, and Galeland even learned to play the fiddle while serving himself in the Texas Cavalry Division of the Confederate Army. We can't extricate their involvement from such evil and wrong deeds, and let's be really clear in saying that the Confederate Army fought for the right to enslave black people for the economic benefit of landed whites. But we can set aside the music and playing and judge those objectively. While most of these pieces don't have lyrics, many of the lyrics in contemporary songs were explicitly racist, and I suspect there's a brown-skinned girl down the road somewhere was too based on the times, as another common song was Run N-Word Run, retitled here as Run Boy Run. Without lyrics and with titles that don't have explicit context, it's hard to say exactly what they meant. So if you know more about these songs in particular, I'd love to hear about it through an anchor voicemail or in a tweet at Cunning Review. With that being said, we'll be reviewing these songs completely as they are, having disclaimed that their performers were closely involved with the Confederacy and with the implication that this important moment in country history is tied deeply with that evil and disgusting movement. To paper over that connection to the Confederacy just because we don't have explicit lyrics that clearly state racist things would be naive and stupid. Now that we've more clearly enumerated the involvement of Robertson and Gleland with the Confederacy, we can definitely say that their fiddle playing was excellent. We'll be reviewing the songs of Robertson in the order they were recorded, so that the first two will be with Henry Gleland, and the final four we review today will round out his 1922 performances. After the episode, we'll add some of Robertson's remaining recordings if you'd like to hear more. One in particular is called The Island Unknown, and features Robertson along with his wife, Nettie, singing what feels like cowboy music around a campfire and telling a story about leaving home. The first ever country music recorded was Arkansas Traveler and it would go on to start an entirely new industry, though country music wouldn't really start to take off until 1927's Jimmy Rogers' song, T for Texas. The fiddling here is extraordinarily complex and fast, a style which Eck Robertson would be known for, and he easily earns fours for authenticity, innovation, and mastery. Robertson would also vary the melodies slightly throughout his repetitions to keep them interesting, though they're so fast that engaging here isn't really a problem. This is one of the two tracks that Robertson would record with Henry Galeland, the other being Turkey in the Straw. Considering that Galeland wasn't asked back for the next day when the other four tracks were recorded, I think that it's safe to say that he wasn't adding a lot. However, he secured his place in history by showing up for that one day because this and the next recording are the only reason we're talking about him at all. Without lyrics, artistic statement is difficult to define here. But there is a statement made in arranging the songs in the way that Eck Robertson did 
which would become to be known as the Texas fiddle style, and for making the statement that fiddle can be a complex and challenging instrument instead of just a hillbilly violin. So Robertson receives a three for artistic statement. With a three in catchiness, Arkansas Traveler earns an 18 out of 25 points. You probably had to learn Turkey in the Straw in a music class somewhere throughout your childhood, as it's a great example of Americana or folk music. And while the melody here is quite embellished and made more complicated in Robertson's version, you can definitely hear the familiar refrain in Robertson's playing. Robertson again plays flourishes over what would have been even the most familiar parts of the songs to make them his own. His style would go on to be imitated in fiddle players for decades following these recordings, for which he said until his death that Victor never paid him correctly. For many of the same reasons as Arkansas Traveler, this song receives an identical Micah score of 18. If you only know one song from Mac Robertson, this should be it. Sally Gooden is Robertson's most famous and most iconic song. It's important to note that in this recording he is playing each piece, live, all at once, earning a five in innovation. There wasn't any dubbing technology available at the time, so he is playing extraordinarily fast and complex music while at the same time it sounds as if he's playing his own accompaniment. He changes the melodies throughout to make the song more complex and interesting, and he shows off exactly how masterfully he could command the fiddle, earning a five. His playing reminds me of the Who's song, Teenage Wasteland, because of the synth intro with so many arpeggiated changes, and it would have been absolutely mind-blowing to see this live in 1922 at some backwoods barn dance. The ending phrasing of the melody is sweet and low as well, showing how Robertson was able to portray different tones all with the same instrument. With a four in authenticity and threes in catchiness and artistic statement, Robertson's most iconic song is also his highest scoring for the year, with a 20 out of 25. In the medley of Sally Johnson and Billy in the Low Ground, there's a much more slow and relaxed pace, and it features Nathaniel Shilkret, Victor's director of foreign music and well-known composer in later life, on the piano for some additional depth. Shilkret doesn't add much but percussion to the song, but in staying out of Robertson's way, he adds enough without taking the attention away from Robertson's fiddle and helps the song earn the 17 overall with fours in authenticity and mastery and threes elsewhere. If you haven't noticed yet, most of the fiddle tunes are organized into repeating sections, usually referred to as A and B, or C, and so on. In Ragtime Annie, the A section is a bit boring and repetitive, but when the B section comes back almost vocally, it makes it much more interesting. With the mismatch in pacing, the song seems the least refined of Robertson's 1922 offerings, and I find myself waiting for the A sections to end to get back into the Bs, which hurts the catchiness and mastery for a two. While authenticity is still a 4, innovation and artistic statement hold 3s for a total score of 15. As we move on to Days Gone, Nathaniel Shilkret comes back to accompany Robertson in this, his last song of 1922, and this seems the most likely to have been played outside of a competition. It's more simple, though still masterful and lively, and it seems the most danceable for that reason, and would have probably been a crowd pleaser. I really enjoyed the B section of Days Gone, as it dips into more somber tones and almost sounds as if it's played with a Jewish or European folk fiddle influence. This addition enriches Robertson's playing with a whole new music and sound, and I really wish we would have heard more of it. The song earns threes across the board save a four in authenticity, which I think no one could deny Robertson, for a total score of 16. That's all for today's episode, but there are more Robertson tunes following the B-side and on the playlist. Tomorrow we'll be back with an episode all about Fanny Bryce, the inspiration for Funny Girl, and a comedic icon. We want to know what you think, whether or not you agree with us, because Cunningham's Law states that the best way to learn something on the internet isn't to ask a question, but to post the wrong answer somewhere. So make sure to find Cunningham's Law subreddit, where we have a dedicated post for this episode at reddit.com slash r slash Cunningham's Law Review. We would love to hear from you through an anchor voicemail or on Twitter at Cunning Review. If you leave us an anchor voicemail that we end up using on the show, we'll review an album of your choice in a special episode, even if it's your own bands. If you like what we're doing here, leave us a review on your favorite podcasting service and follow the podcast on Spotify. And if you don't like it, definitely don't mention that to anybody. Until next time, I've been your host, Richie, and you've been listening to Cunningham's Law Review. Our theme music is a difficult subject by The Insider, and nobody else works here. Nothing.